Okay, so everyone, welcome to today's coffee seminar. I think it's the last seminar for this year, for 2023. And so, Gita, please, can you, the next slide? Sure. So, to, maybe you've seen this in the program. Today's uh, presenter is Dr. Sokita Srivaratan uh, about Australian indigenous edible halophytes, potential sources of functional ingredients, a very interesting topic. Uh, Sokita, please, the next slide. As you, I think <laughs> most of us, of, most of you, sorry, most of you know me already. It's always the same slide. So I think I facilitated the fifth seminar this year. So I'm Michael Netzel, a res senior research fellow from the Center for Nutrition and Food Sciences at Quafi. Next slide, please. And before we start the seminar, seminar, I uh, uh, would like to acknowledge. Um, I will do the acknowledgement of country, and I would like to acknowledge the traditional uh, owners and the custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the traditional owners, I pay respect to the ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Next slide, slide please. As usual, we have you know the usual uh, um, housekeeping. Uh, housekeeping things and the seminar is scheduled from 12 to 1 o'clock, depending how long Sokita uh, will talk. Then we have usually 15, 20 minutes time for Q&A session. And um, we will hold this session at the end. So please put all your questions in the Q&A in the Q&A tab and not the chat function. So please, that's important. So we'll check this then at the end of the seminar and go through all your questions. And Sokita will try to answer uh, your questions. If there's some additional questions uh, and we don't, you know, we have to close the seminar at one o'clock. So Kita is more than happy uh, to answer this uh, offline and you just can send her an email. Next slide, Sokita. Yeah, it's a great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Sukita Srivaratan. Sukita uh, is a lecturer at the Department of Biosystems Technology, Faculty of Technology at the University of Jaffna uh, in Sri Lanka. And Sukita is a present PhD graduate from the University of Queensland. Maybe I think some of you at least met Sukita once. And during her PhD, she was investigating Australian indigenous edible halophytes as a potential source of functional ingredients. Uh, so Kita graduated from the University of, so hopefully now I get it right, Paradenia in Sri Lanka in uh, 2017 with a master's degree in food science and technology. While in Sri Lanka, she also earned her bachelor's degree in food science and nutrition in 2014 and professional qualification in human resource management in 2015. There are also a lot of lot of more things about Sakita, very positive things. And I was, um, maybe most of you know that, um, her principal advisor. And yeah, and Sakita was really an excellent student and did a lot of uh, things and activities outside her PhD. Uh, and uh, maybe I forgot to mention that um, uh, her PhD and Sokita was also part of the IRC Industrial Transformation Training Center for Uniquely Australian Foods. Sokita, so now I'm handing over to you and please, you know, start your presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So before we start the presentation, it's my duty to acknowledge the country. So I too acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respect to the ancestors and their descendants. Well, for as long as the climate conditions and aridity become more volatile due to global warming, the impact of soil salinization will continue to threaten the agricultural sustainability. And it is estimated that more than 50% of arable land will be salinized by 2050. This will become a further disaster with the forecasted world population of 9.7 billion people by 2050. On the other hand, let's look at the present scenario of plant food consumption. Though plant food plays a vital role in human nutrition, 
more than 90 percentage of food demand is satisfied by less than 0.1 percentage of the edible plants and none of the highly consumed food plants can survive without freshwater irrigation. Therefore, it is clear that we need a solution to overcome this soil salinization as well as food insecurity. Then the million dollar question is, what's the solution? Where can we find the solution? To make this more clear, here we are heading towards. Australian indigenous edible halophytes, potential sources of functional ingredients. I am Suhida Sriwaradhan. Michael already gave a nice introduction, but just to wrap up, uh, I'm Suhida Srivadan, as I said, and a lecturer attached to the Department of Biosystem Technology, Faculty of Technology, University of Jaffna, Sri Lanka. I was born and brought up in Sri Lanka. I did my bachelor's in food science and nutrition at Vyamba University of Sri Lanka in 2014, and my master's in food science and technology at University of Peradeniya in 2017. I also had a professional qualification in human resource management. I'm a recent PhD holder from ARC Industrial Transformation Training Center for Uniquely Australian Foods, Queensland Iron for Agriculture and Food Innovation, the University of Queensland. And my advisory panel members of my PhD are Dr. Michael Netzer, who is facilitating this session today, and Professor Yasmina, Dr. Ahn, and Dr. Olivia. Well. The sequence of human food consumption is not usually static. Firstly, the human beings attempt to utilize various natural produce for food solely to satisfy hunger. Later, they had choices to select in times of surplus and they learn how to produce food in terms of cooking, preservation through evolution. As cultural and commercial perspectives became exchanged and ancient civilization started to modernize, food became as a social symbol. In recent years, the biodiversity of plants has been vanished at an alarming rate due to climate change and industrial development. In addition to that, under utilization of natural resources, the salinity of soil and water, along with food insecurity, becomes the major constraint worldwide. It was estimated that Salinity affects approximately 52.7 million hectare in Asia, 14.8 sorry, 8 million hectare in Africa, and 1.8 million hectare in southwestern Australia. And salinity is projected to increase the effects to about 17 million hectare in another 14 years. As I said earlier, salinization is gradually increasing over irrigating areas and cropping soils and challenging the governments in many countries. Currently, the major crops and forage plants are soil sensitive, while halophytes can adapt to the extensive range of salinities. So far, we have talked about halophytes, but what is halophytes? Halophytes are soil tolerant species corresponding to one percentage of the world's flora and are found in saline areas, including salt marshes, salt deserts, mangroves, and sand dunes near to the beaches. In my PhD study, we systematically investigated four different plant species, such as Atriplus, Trechnicornia, Sueda, and Sesuvium, with spinach as a control for comparison. Well, we hypothesized that Australian indigenous edible halophytes have nutritional benefits, bioactive properties, and the potential to be used as food ingredients or functional food ingredients with the aims of investigating the safety, nutritional, and bioactive properties of four important Australian indigenous edible halophytes, Atriplus species, Solbush, Technicornia species, Samphire, Sueda species, Sea Blight, and Sesuvium species, Sea Purslane, and value addition to the diet as a functional salt substitute. <coughs> Sorry. In order to achieve the aims, we constructed four different objectives. The first one is to determine the nutritional composition and bioactive properties, for example, antioxidant capacity, antimicrobial activity of Atriplus species, Technicornia species, Sueda species, and Sesuvium species, and then to determine the anti nutritional components in the selected Australian indigenous edible halophytes. 
Thereafter, to develop a halophyte-based test food and select the most promising halophytes in terms of nutritional, bioactive and sensory properties, focusing on the potential to be used as a natural salt substitute. And then finally, to determine and compare the digestive characteristics of the developed halophyte-based food product using the Infogest 2.0 static in vitro digestion system and the CACO2 HC29 cell membrane model. Before we move into the findings of my PhD, let's review the literature. Since it's all about halophytes, let's see what is halophytes and their importance is. Halophytes are soil plants or soil loving plants, having the ability of growing and reproducing in high salinity areas during wholly or partly. Halophyte does not belong to any specific taxonomy or any geological region. Halophytes have various intrinsic mechanisms to compete oxygenation damages and salinity. The salt and drought tolerance of halophytes related to the formation of various biocompounds which possess beneficial activities as antioxidant, anti-tumor, antimicrobial agents. And these reported biological activities enhance the nutritional value of halophytes over glycophytes, means salt-sensitive plants. Now let's see about our plants one by one. First one is solbush. Solbush is a member of the genus Atriplus. Atriplus genus has a worldwide distribution and contains over 400 species, of which 156 species have been recorded only in Australia. It has been utilized for livestock fodder and rangeland rehabilitation. Humans also consume as a famine food. The amino acid composition is promising in Atriplus numeraria, means old man solbush, particularly methionine and lysine, which are higher than reported in cereals. And when it comes to Atriplus halimus, it was found to be as one of the medicinal plants in conventional Arabic medicine. Let's move to the second one, that is Samphire. Samphire is a halophyte belong to the genus Tecticornia. Genus Tecticornia belongs to subfamily Salicornoidea. Actually, the entire subfamily Salicornoidea called as Samphires. It has a worldwide distribution and contains over 110 species, of which 44 species have been recorded in Australia. In fact, Australia is the center of diversity and dominance for Technicornia genus. Studies reported the potential of Technicornia species as an animal feed, cooked vegetable, especially in times of famine, and as sunscreen as well as a salt substitute. Technicornia species change coloration from green to red, you can witness in the slide, during periodic changes under unfavorable conditions. However, samphire is still underutilized or neglected though Australia is with abundant resources of genus Technicornia. Third one is sea blight. Sea blight is a member of the genus Sueda. Sueda species are predominantly found in salt marshes of arid, semi-arid and coastal arenas. Sueda genus has diverse applications for food and non-food uses from the ancient time. For example, various parts of the plants are utilized in traditional cuisine and folk medicine in, in India. The young leaves usually mixed with other vegetables to lessen its saltiness because it is highly salty, while young shoots of Sueda maritima were utilized to make pickle. Juice extracted from Sueda maritima was found to possess antiviral activities. Last but not least, sea purslane. Sea purslane is a halophyte belongs to the genus Sesivium. It's an underutilized succulent plant distributed in coastal saline soils or inland habitats. Sesivium genus has a worldwide tropical distribution and contains over 12 species. Sesivium potlocastrum has diverse applications from its use as an environmental protectant in arid and semi-arid regions and utilized in the desert greenification to its use in food, forage, and folk medicine. It has been also consumed as a cooked vegetable in India, Southeast Asia, and Southern Thailand. So far, we reviewed what was reported in the literature, and now let's see 
what's the gap in terms of knowledge. Despite of few indigenous communities, much lesser aware of the use of Australian indigenous edible halophytes as therapeutic agents and potential dietary sources. When I was starting this study, no study was published or investigated yet on nutritional profile and potential bioactivities of selected Australian indigenous edible halophytes, particularly Technicornia species and Sueda arbusculoids. Though Atriplus numillaria was consumed as a feed and fodder, the studies related to dietary relevance and bioactivities concerning human consumption is still unknown. The phytochemicals in Australian indigenous edible halophytes, its impact on human health and in vitro bioaccessibility and intestinal absorption are also less reported. And studies concerning on their anti-nutritional factors are less reported. So taking together all these queries and facts seeks more investigation. And here we are. The approximate analysis was conducted according to the AOAC methods and as shown as follows. As you can see, fiber, protein, fat, and ash content of Atriplus species is higher than the other Australian indigenous edible halophytes. Remarkably, Sueda species proved to be a significant source of calcium and iron and compensated, sorry, compensated the lower contents of major nutrients. Concerning mineral analysis, you can see the most abundant mineral was sodium, irrespective of the species, as their name, halophyte, implies. This study also analyzed fatty acid content and its composition. As you can see, palmitic acid was the predominant saturated fatty acid in the Australian indigenous edible halophytes, whereas oleic acid was the predominant monounsaturated fatty acid. In fact, only monounsaturated fatty acid, which was found in Australian indigenous edible halophytes. Since PUFA uh, can provide a broad range of benefits, when it comes to Australian indigenous edible halophytes, you can see almost all Australian indigenous edible halophytes contain more than 40% of polyunsaturated fatty acid, which is, which is a positive facts towards these halophytes. We have also analyzed the pigmented Australian indigenous edible halophytes. Pigmented in the sense, uh, when I started the presentation in the, when I talked about samphire and sea person, I mentioned that during the unfavorable condition, you can see the coloration from green to red. So we have analyzed those pigmented Australian indigenous edible halophytes, particularly samphire and sea parsley, and the identified pigment was beta lines, which you can see in the beetroot. The identification of the beta line was based on the molecular masses determined by UHPLCMS and the comparison of UV spectral characteristics. The four major beta lines identified for the first time in Technicornia and SESVM samples are celosianin 2, isocelosianin 2, betanin, and isobetanin. As you can see, vitamin C was highest in sea purslane and uh, folate was highest in salt bush. However, though both values are still significantly lower than the spinach, uh, 250 gram of sea salt bush provide 38% 38 of recommended dietary intake of folates, whereas 100 gram of sea purslane provide 80% of the recommended dietary intake of vitamin C for adults, similar to 100 gram of fresh serving of spinach. When it comes to organic acid, the total organic acid content was highest in sea purslane. And <coughs> sorry, quinic acid was the highest organic acid in almost all the Australian indigenous edible halophytes, except in samphire, followed by citric acid and malic acid. The total organic acid and its content is important since it impacts the sensorial properties of plant-derived products and subsequently their consume acceptance. After completing the nutritional profiling, we also found the essence of identifying anti-nutrients in the Australian indigenous edible halophytes, and the results showed that all the determined anti-nutrients were all lower than the control spinach, except for hydrolyzable tannin, which was higher in sole bush. Well, the results of both the antioxidant and antimicrobial activity of Australian indigenous edible halophytes are shown here. 
The total phenolic content ranged from 6.4 to 24.7 milligram gallic acid equivalent per gram dry weight with Solbush and Samphire having the lowest and highest values respectively. When it comes to this antimicrobial activity, the water extracts of Samphire sample showed moderate antimicrobial activity against the Staphylococcus aureus, whereas ethanolic extracts of C. purslane showed low antimicrobial activity. <coughs> Sorry. However, both sea blight and soil bush exhibits actually to fail to exhibit antimicrobial activity against the tested microorganism using any of the solvents. After completing the nutritional profiling, as I mentioned in my objective number three, and by activities, we conducted the sensory study to identify the select and most promising halophyte for the halophyte-based test food. Firstly, we conducted the benchtop sensory study using experienced testers to select the most promising halophytes. As you can see, the flavor description for the each halophytes are vary from one to another. When it comes to sea blight, it is more fruity, sweet, and herbaceous, and very salty. And when it comes to salt bush, it was bitter. Some of them felt astringent, herbaceous. Some of them felt like green tea leaf or mint tea. And samphire was my favorite. Nutty, whole grain. And it was like herby and uh, moreover like cereal-like flavor. And the sea purslane was soapy, astringent, heavy, and uh, fibrous. Though sea blight was highly commented, However, the samphire was selected as the most promising halophyte based on the both the sensory attributes as well as the nutritional significance. And it was planned to proceed with Solbush because that is the only commercial available halophyte for the formal sensory session. This is the results of the formal sensory study. As you can see, mean value of descriptive scores of Different samphire test food sensory attributes are shown here. Samphire 2 means samphire samples obtained obtain from location 2 perceive significantly dry herbs aroma and flavor than samphire samples obtained from location 1 and 3. It is interesting that almost all samphire test food had similar level of bran aroma and flavor irrespective of the locations. However, the saltiness was varied with the concentration of samphire added and one percentage of samphire samples and the controlled salty semolina found with no significant differences. It means the optimal concentration for the samphire tense food is one percentage free stride powder. Like samphire, salt bush test food variants had herbaceous aroma respective of the location from where they were collected, as you can see from here. Similar level of herbaceous uh, aroma and flavor, though no, no significant differences were found for five attributes between salt bush across three different locations. Certain sensory attributes characterize each salt bush samples. It means when it comes to salt bush F5, you can see it was perceived with high green fruit aroma and flavor whereas salt bush sample obtained from SBOM, it was perceived with strongly or uh, very higher uh, minty dry wood aroma. Unlike samphire, the optimal concentration for the salt bush test food are varied with, a crop, varied with the location. For example, it was equivalent at uh, salt bush FWE was 1.4 percentage. When it comes to SPFA, it was 1.8 percentage for SBOM was 2 percentage, unlike Samphire. And in Samphire, it was 1 percentage across the locations. So the spider plot of mean scores clearly distinguished because it is easy for you to understand clearly distinguished the tested food sample. For example, Samphire samples obtained from location 2 had higher dry herbs aroma and flavor with woodiness texture. When it comes to uh, SPFI, it was highly, it was it, it had the higher green fruit aroma and flavor with increased saltiness and lingering saltiness. 
and we also check the the interaction between the nutritional properties and the uh, sensory properties by put the, taking them together and uh, conduct the P PCA principal component analysis. The PCA biplot with the different attributes of the sample is shown here. The first two principal components explain 78% of the variation in the data, and you can see there were three uh, major clusters formed. When it comes to Solbush, here two clusters were formed and SPOM was clearly distinguished with this SPFI and this SPWE. And we also analyzed the protein digestibility and ion absorption. As you can see, the protein digestibility increased with time. Although Solbush had higher protein content, Samphire had a higher protein digestibility with an overall increased percentage of release of primary amines compared to G30. And when it comes to this ion absorption, ferritin production in response to the Samphire test route was the highest compared to Solbush digester, which produced a lower level of ferritin. In this study, we also able to analyze the bioaccessibility of minerals and trace elements in Samphire Solbush test food digester sample. The bioaccessibility of the divalent cations means here magnesium, iron, and uh, zinc. In both Samphire and uh, Samphire test food digester, as well as Solbush and Solbush test food digester, significantly decreased from G0 to G30 and remained significantly lower throughout the gastrointestinal digestion. The bioaccessibility of the monovalent cations means sodium and potassium was different from the trends observed from the divalent cations. Overall, the halophyte free stride powders showed higher divalent cation bioaccessibility when compared to the halophyte test food, means halophyte and the semolina, suggesting that the food matrix impacted mineral bioaccessibility. <clears throat> so to sum up my presentation, <clears throat> Australian indigenous edible halophyte differ in the nutritional composition and in vitro activities. The results showed the variation in the same species from uh, different sublocations, indicating potential effect of different growing locations. When it comes to Technicone indica, Atriplus numilaria, and Sesvian portacaster means some fire, solbush, and uh, sea purslane contain more fiber than the commercial Australian baby spinach. And uh, the major Better lines identified in betanin, isobetanin, celosian 2, and isocelosian 2. As I already mentioned, a 250 gram serving of fresh atriplus numilaria, similar to 250 gram of strawberry, would supply 38% of recommended dietary intake of folate for adults. And the organic acids are malic, isocitric, citric, and quinic acid can be found in the uh, studied Australian indigenous edible halophytes. When it comes to this antimicrobial activity, the water extracts of samphire showed moderate antimicrobial activity against the tested gram positive Staphylococcus aureus. And the sensory study, the samphire was selected as the most promising halophyte based on its sensorial attributes and the nutritional composition. And the Samphire test food variant exhibited dry herb and bran aroma and flavor, whereas the sole bush test food variants had herbaceous, sorry, minty dry wood and green food aroma and flavor. The results clearly indicate that the growing location of Samphire, particularly in sole bush, can significantly impact their sensory attributes. When it comes to this optimal concentration, uh, the Samphire it was determined as one percentage, and uh, for sole bush it was determined as 1.4 to 2 percentage. And the results showed that Samphire had a protein, a higher protein digestibility compared to salt bush, and Samphire had highest in vitro ion absorption compared to salt bush. So throughout my PhD, I already published six peer-reviewed publications directly related to PhD thesis, plus three peer-reviewed publications not directly related to PhD thesis, but similar topic. And uh, another one is already submitted, and it's under review, and two more. Uh, to be submitted. And if you want, because of the time concern, I couldn't present all the results here. But if you want to learn uh, more about halophytes and about uh, uh, or the additional things about the halophytes on my study, you can uh, refer all these publications. And uh, these are the other highlights during PhD journey, even in the when, when we started the presentation, I was talking to Michael that this is my 29th presentation. 
through this PhD journey. And uh, apart from these this conferences and all, I was an invited speaker at uh, TROPAC conference last year. And uh, yes, uh, with the help of media people and everyone, we go, we are we are unfortunate uh, to have a media release on Australian Indigenous Adipal Halophytes. We had a meet, I think we had a media release in February this year, uh, with the advertising value of this much and with the huge uh, views. And uh, uh, as a part of my PhD, I also got a chance to do the career development scholarship extension. I did the placement in CSARO uh, for about uh, six, uh, uh, yeah, about four months. And um, yes, this was a beautiful memory that I always cherish in my heart. That was the visit to Twin Lakes Cultural Park uh, because I have been working more than everybody knew that. I have been working for more than three years in the labs uh, because of the COVID-19, because we were, we were the unfortunate batch. We got stuck in between the COVID and um, I, we never had a chance to visit any of the conferences uh, except this drop pack. I mean, uh, other state conferences or any of the conferences because of the COVID. And uh, yeah, it was such a uh, hectic life in the labs and all. And finally, I got the chance to see the land and the people that grow these amazing plants, especially my halophytes. So it, it happened after my thesis review, in fact. We were joined by the Madonna and Michelle uh, for this uh, wonderful journey. They are the, our other indigenous, indi indigenous partners. The entire family, who is the pillar of the Twingless Culture Park, the Bruno and family, they were really happy. As you can see that I was presenting the results in the mid of the, the, the land. I was presenting and they were really happy about the results and the findings. And uh, they actually, they were really motivating. And uh, throughout this journey, their, their motivation and the, uh, throughout the supply of the samples are highly commendable. And uh, yes, the warm weather, the broom was warm, very warm. And the red soil of broom reminded me of my home because my Jaffna, the climate also same in Sri Lanka. And uh, apart from these visits and all, uh, I got a chance to present and demonstrate the nutritional benefits of Australian indigenous edible halophytes at local schools and out of school children at the youth care centers. Yes, I'm an also accredited UQ mental health first aider. So now it's time for me to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which the botanical we study are harvested and respect the knowledge and experience the traditional owners hold regarding the care, harvest and use of these plants. This project is sponsored by the Australian Research Council Industrial Transformation Training Center for Uniquely Australian Foods, Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation, the University of Queensland. And my sincere gratitude towards my advisory team, my review panel and whoever the people who were mentioned in this uh, slide, as well as I should thank the ARC Center, University of Queensland, AHET, for the funding and uh, Twin Lakes Cultural Park for providing the samples. And yeah, that's all about my presentation. Uh, I'm just handing over to the facilitator. Thank yes, you. thanks very much, Sakita, for this really, really interesting presentation. And what you said, you know, you, you generated much more data and results, which you, you know, um, didn't present today even we still had maybe still had uh, um, um, 10 minutes but that's that's fine I think you know that's a lot of results and yeah the seminar is open for for discussions so if you have any questions for Sakita please type in in the Q&A tab oh there's already one hang on Okay, I'm just reading from Uda thank you for your nice presentation uh, Sakita when you were presenting what uh, came to my mind was sea weeds can be a very big competitor to saltbush. What are your thoughts for selecting saltbush over sea weeds? Because sea weeds are already a promising bioactive foods when we think about industrial scale. Good question from, from Uda. Thank you, Uda. Actually, as Michael said, it's a very good question. Uh, when it comes to seaweed, yes, it has a uh, it, I think it, it it's a good source of protein and other things, but uh, when we do, if I'm right, if I uh, because I I also tasted some seaweeds and uh, when it comes to this soul bush, it's not only it's a good source of protein, it has other benefits as well, and it's a very good source of folate and all. And for example, as I always say, 
uh, you can have a 100% a nutritious food, but at the end, it should be palatable. And uh, when it comes to these uh, sensory studies or consumer studies, people should be able to prefer what is uh, palatable or what is uh, which one is okay to have without any aroma and flavor. Because if I'm right, I think seaweed has a unpleasant aroma for me. I'm sorry, but it depends on the people. For for me, it it has an unpleasant aroma. But when it comes to solvage, it's not like uh, seaweed. There are seaweed with different different uh, aroma properties and all. But yeah, in, in terms of sensory study, I still prefer soul bush or halophyte. But yes, as you say, it is a really a competitor for halophytes, not only soul bush. I hope I answered the question. You know, I think it's 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 a good question. And we really actually didn't um I'm not sure about any uh scientific papers comparing, you know, these two uh as competitors. Maybe the then I'm not sure if you maybe should call them competitors maybe they can both add to a you know sustainable or diverse diet and what Sakita said I remember once but you know that's not not scientifically uh, uh, uh proven um, um these commercial seaweed snacks and some of them they still still have these these I'm not sure how I'm not a sensory uh, uh, uh expert so how you describe but these not fishy but this a bit yeah uh, like sea, I don't know, sea fishy weed, a flavor, very, very, very slight, but still there. So maybe there's also something which maybe more really plant food based or on um, seaweed like like sensory uh, uh, preferences. And yeah, this could be, but and also the saltiness and for different products. So maybe yeah. they're not really competitors, maybe for really uh, two, let's say, alternative sources for 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 different different product streams yeah can i add one more yes and then we've got already yeah. new questions yeah <laughs> okay. yeah please please again okay. because uh, as uh, when we talk about the application seaweed and uh, solvage because here the our main application was as a potential functional ingredient and what we focused was only salt substitute so when it comes to this i don't uh, i think if i'm right i think uh, halophytes have much more saltier than the seaweed and uh, when considering about the salt substitute only, even still halophytes have more beneficial than the seaweed. But still, as I said uh, to Michael and uh, everyone that uh, still we don't have the, uh, we, we, we haven't studied actually, we didn't compare seaweeds and salt bush or seaweeds and other halophyte. But yeah, there, there's, there's, there can be opportunities that we, are, we can compare all these things. Thank you. Okay, this next question from Ishaya. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, Dr. Sukita. What are the challenges and opportunities for cultivating and harvesting edible halophytes in Australia? And what are the environmental and social impacts of doing so? Actually, uh, whatever the samples which were provided by the community and all are wild harvested samples. So the biggest challenge was that is the one because it's it's uh, we can't ensure the quality all the time because these are wild harvested ones and about the supply also same and uh, when it comes to this harvesting it's not seasonal so that's a great opportunity because anytime you can get them but again the wild harvest is the problem so what's the next question uh, yeah, and what are the environmental and social impacts? So you, you, I think you already answered this, you know, because at the moment for your study, you used wild harvested yeah. samples, so there won't, was no additional. Don't but it's it's a good question when you think about maybe if if for future demand, you know, and if if it's really for for not maybe on a in, yeah kind of industrial scale, and you need really then like for seaweed, you know, much more if. Then maybe you have to cultivate, or if you can still uh, um, satisfy the demand, you know, by wild harvest. I mean, that's a that's a that's a that's a question, you know. That's a good question, you know. Or will it be maybe more still a kind of a niche 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 alternative for product? But yeah, no thanks, thanks, Ishaya. That's hopefully question answered. So that's just from from Uda again. Yes, you did answer in that seaweed. You know, the seaweed industry is already a really big one, especially in Asian countries. That's right. So that's something we sell of fights. I think they're really more. Um, at the moment uh, um, coming 
And if you look in the literature, you know, all these industry news, there are very now more and more, you know, reports about seaweed, especially salt bush, you know. So there is, there is, I think there's a lot of things going on at the moment and and uh, getting more and more popular. Then there's a question from uh, Bernadine. Thanks so much for presenting today. Do you think the commercially grown halophytes would have the same nutritional properties as the wild harvest? That's a very good question. Even we had the same question because uh, now uh, because of the demand of the uh, uh, salt substitute, if I'm right, I think they were predicted that uh, in, by 2030, the <clears throat> salt substitute market will become 2.3 billion US dollars. So if so, the the wild harvest or whatever the samples, but wild harvested samples are not enough to add, to cater the needs for the community. I mean, for the society and all. So in that case, uh, there are countries, Portugal, if I'm right, I think Portugal and Italy, they already started planting these. Uh, they have started to grow them in the greenhouse, but uh, I think they, now they are they have started the studies. But uh, unfortunately, we haven't we didn't compare the results with that one. But uh, yeah, because they, they were trying to implement the same uh, salinity level by using the uh, artificial uh, salinization. But still, uh, there must be differences, if I'm right. But I'm not sure. But yeah, I, I can follow up on this. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks, Akita. So we didn't, but it's a good question, Bernadine. I think, yeah, we usually would expect differences, you know, what we saw from some other, like citrus, you know, it's cultivated or wild harvest. But yeah, we, we, we don't have really data now on this. Uh, yeah, no thanks. So, any other questions? I think Bernadine was the last one in the in the tip. So, I have one. So, Keith, I know you know I know you well, and and also you you work and and we, we, I mean we had discussion before. You know, you presented um you know salt or the halophytes as a as as a is the main aim as a salt substitute. But also, I think you can you had once this very nice uh, photo about you know using um i'm not sure was it salt bush or samphire as a topping Sam or maybe fire. as a side dish you know which i think is another option maybe as a fresh one you know you can or mix with salad and and can you if you have any thoughts about this you know if these or any data are still um another alternative you know not using as yeah. a or like, like a freeze dried or blend more like you know just fresh like a like a vegetable yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it, it's already in the market. I think in Italy, it's it's quite common, uh, especially samphire, but not Technicornia species. I think that the, the the species that they have in their commercial market is Salicornia. That is also another samphire. So they just use them as a leafy vegetables, in fact. So you can have them like a salad, or you can have them in, in, incorporated in the uh, pastry products or anything just for the breakfast and all and uh, and also uh, even we had a discussion that uh, depend on the nature of this one we were thinking about uh, maybe the in this interested com uh, industry companies may thinking about making something like a soup or not like a bouillon Bullion, just freeze, yeah. yeah just freeze dry them and just add with the just hot water and all so it can be that can be another one and when it comes to this uh, because in this study because of the time uh, constraint and all I just uh, identified only better lines. So when it comes to these plants, actually, we can just explore other pigments as well. So in that case, because so far, when it comes to these better lines, uh, it, it's a very good colorant. But uh, unfortunately, B2 is the only source that we are getting the better lines and all. So there can be more, there can be more chances for us to extract the better lines from these plants as well. Not only better lines, the other colorants. <laughs> So these are the different opportunities. Mm -hmm. And uh, even I forgot to tell you that because when it comes to this uh, salt bush, salt bush is uh, very good in foliage and fiber and protein. When it comes to the samphire, samphire is very good source of fiber, uh, considerable amount of protein, micro animals and minerals, as well as the beta lines and other bioactive compounds. So when we add them together, so that's, I haven't done in my study, but when we add them together, there must be a synergetic effect or there must be antagonist effect. So we can check that one as well. So it will be another study in future, I guess. 
Yes, for, for another PhD. Now, I was also thinking, you know, when you when you add, for example, the you presented all the nutrients and you know some bioactive compounds as a as a, like like a side dish. You know, you you from a nutritional context or perspective, if you eat like let's say 150 grams of fresh one, you can for sure consume much more of these nutrients than like a freeze dried powder in a blend. You know what I mean? That's all yeah. my thinking because if you just see this in a context and and say, look, I add like a, a spoon of of halophytes, you know, or as a bouillon or like, um, you know, as a salt substitute, for sure you will get some of the nutrients, but the 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 total amount compared to a fresh serve would be very low, like like yeah. 150. Even it's dry, right? You know, if you eat like let's say 150 grams or something, you know, as a salad or or topping, just thinking another alternative, you know. Um, you can use it, which may be not so for seaweed, but as a really as a fresh, in a fresh form, you know, for 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 food and or add to your food. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I see still thirteen participants are are um, attending, which is great. From twenty or twenty one. <laughs> so if you still have a question, so please now. Otherwise, we will. To the Move next slide. To the next slide, yes. And what I said, if you have a question later on, you know, please feel free um, to send to Kita just an email. Uh, uh, and and I think she's more than happy to answer your questions when when you know if possible. Yeah. No. Look. As always, the last slide. So thanks very much for zooming in. I know it's 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 getting really. It's crazy busy at the end of the year and and it's always over lunch time and you're all you know have so many things to do or wrapping up you know before the end of the year so really appreciate this that you um you're uh, attending zoom uh as always you can get information from the website about the seminars the 2024 seminar series and you can uh, sign up for the the letter um that you're on the email list via coffee uh, hyphen science hyphen seminars at uq.edu.au and another one which is different only uh, after today at this seminar so please let us know what you think about the seminar and you know the frequency and how it's organized and if you fill if you can fill out our science uh, seminar feedback survey by scanning just the uh, QR code it's here on the on the slide and I think when you got the email um, that would be great to get some feedback and that we can you know always try to improve uh, yeah the process procedure and and you know the seminar that would be uh, really good so again thanks very much for for your attendance and zooming in and see you on and all hopefully in 2024 see you then bye bye